from Trimble Construction, you're listening to the Connected Construction Show, where we connect you to the contractors, owners, designers, engineers, and construction professionals who are finding better ways to work. And now, here's your host, Matt Sprague. Hello and welcome to the Connected Construction Show. I'm your host, Matt Sprague. We're very excited uh, for this week's episode of the Connected Construction Show. I have my co-host, uh, Ben Wallbank, that is joining us. Uh, ben, why don't you quickly just tell us a little bit about yourself. This is your first time on the show, so I'm sure our our listeners are eager to learn about yeah, you. Yeah, I'm Ben Wallbank. Uh, I'm the BIM Strategy and Partnerships Manager for uh, Trimble Viewpoint in EMEA. Um, I sit on various uh, committees, the uh, UK BIM Alliance Technologies Group, uh, the uh, GIG Interoperability Group, and I'm an architect by background. I trained back in the dark ages at the Bartlett at UCL. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we have you. We're gonna. You're bringing a uh, much more uh, knowledge-based perspective to this conversation. And this week's guest uh, from uh, from from the Kane Group, we have Gary Cowan, who is the head of digital construction. And a lot of our conversation today is going to be around uh, BIM strategy. Uh, so, Ben, that's where you're going to be able to leverage the your experience and your knowledge to help really kind of help us dive into this conversation. But with that, Gary, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, what you do at Kane, uh, and what your passions are within the construction industry. Well, hello, guys. Thanks very much. That's a lot to ask for. I know oh, yeah. that was a lot. Thanks very much for the invite. It's great to be here today. Uh, my name is Gary Kahn, and I'm the head of digital construction for Kane Group. Uh, my background, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I studied at Queen's University, Belfast, and graduated around about 2006. Um, and then went out into the construction industry where I've kind of made my way up the ladder ever since. And just recently there this year, I was promoted to head of digital construction for Kane Group, where I oversee all of the digital construction methodology and technologies and training for all of the staff that we have here on board. Uh, and we're involved in a lot of very uh, prestigious projects, mostly London based, um, and they're all quite big projects and basically everything that we do is done through BIM and, and digital construction now. Um, I've been here at Keynes probably going on nine to ten years now, probably. Um, when I first started in Keynes, I basically came in as a BIM technician, um, just the first guy in the door that ever knew anything about BIM. And over the last nine years, I've kind of developed a really robust in-house uh, BIM solution and team underneath me uh, that we're currently working on quite a lot of really good projects in London and having great success in using BIM for our projects. Awesome. Awesome. So I know we've got um, in our, our pre-show meetings, we discussed uh, however many topics that we could, we could kind of get to. Um, and uh, in the period of time that we have for the show, we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible, but we're, we're not going to stop it in terms of any tangents that go that we go off. I was telling Ben before he has uh, explicit permission to go off on, on, on tangents uh, into any of these topics. And the good news would be is if we don't get to some of these really interesting pieces, uh, we're going to invite you back to, for, for another show. So um, whether you like it or not, Gary. No, so, that's great. Uh, but uh, with, with that, Ben, I'll, I'll let you kick it off with the first question that you had. So, um the UK government's construction 2025 paper um, sets out targets of 33% lower costs and 50% faster delivery. Now, modern methods of construction, MMC, in other words, more off-site fabrication, less on-site construction, more site assembly, are often pointed to as key drives towards achieving this target. So my first question kind of comes in two parts. What are your experiences of, of this at Kane? And do you think these targets are achievable? Well, whenever I first joined Kane, right about nine years ago, obviously it was quite a traditional contractor in the sense that the majority of the work was undertaken on site. You know, we would have produced quite detailed drawings of the design and the intent, but all of that would have been done 
on site, you know, by engineers on the ground, um, with a ratio of probably 80% of the considerations and working out done on the site, for example, of fixtures and fittings and clips and hangers and things like that. Quite a lot of that was kind of worked out by the guys on the ground using the drawings um, and kind of figuring out routes and methods of fixtures and fittings. But as we have progressed through the last nine years, that has kind of almost totally flipped to the other side now, whereas in our BIM models, we are now modeling all of the hangers and fixtures and clips. And Kian, as we are, we have a quite a large uh, prefabrication facility here at our main office in Bambridge. We've got a very large um, warehouse and a very large production facility with overhead cranes. So we're really in a key position to be able to offer our clients a full prefabrication service. So what we do now is we take each job individually and we sort of analyze it at the very start and we work out really how much of that job can be done off site and prefabricated here at home. And there's a there's a number of reasons for that. You know, we can have so much more quality control on the product that is being created in our own warehouse. There's much uh, tighter control on health and safety because there's far much or far less activities on site we try to reduce as much of the hot works and the cutting and the grinding on site as possible where we can really keep an eye on the health and safety of the guys in the warehouse much better than we could trying to chase 30 or 40 guys running about a very large building site so we really do try and focus as much as we can on the prefabrication element and the clients that we're working for are really starting to buy into it. Quite a lot of the main contractors here in the UK, like Balfour Beatty and Wilma Dixon's, are all kind of starting on that road of prefabrication. And we are in a prime position to be able to offer that service to our clients. Um, it's just it's just the way it's going. But it, the, the, the for many, many reasons, not only just health and safety and quality, but even costs for us as a contractor, you know, the costs of, of paying guys to do the work here, is probably quite a bit less than the guys doing it in London as well. So for us as a company, it, it works out quite a lot better for us for profit margins and, and things like that. And what we find is when this stuff comes to site, because of the level of consideration that we've given it and the sort of systems that we have in place now, such as virtual reality and augmented reality, when the stuff comes to site, it's almost just like a, a Lego set for the guys to put together. It comes with almost a, a booklet of instructions. And we also use other technologies such as precision laser setting out. So if we were bringing in, say, for example, a module frame that was all preloaded with pipework and tray, the point that that would fix to the soffit, we put coordinate points into the model. And then we have a precision engineering team on site who basically go on site as soon as uh, an area is cast and the props are removed. Our guys are straight in, first in, and the guys are taking uh, robotic total stations onto the floor, and they're marking out the positions of all of the fixtures and hangers and clips, even right down to the center line directions of all of the services, so that we can be in, mark out the entire underside of the slab, and then our guys come in and first fix and blitz the entire floor in one hit, rather than the old traditional way of the props would have came down, the guys doing the walls, the borders would have been in, putting all their head tracks, floor tracks, the skeletons of the walls, boarding one side. By the time our guys would have hit the floor, it's like a it's like a rat maze. You know, the guys are navigating corridors in and out of rooms. Um, so what we found was that by us being able to get in early and get all the first fix done, it sort of it was it was a massive leap in time for us, probably an eight times. You know, it would take us maybe eight weeks for a traditional floor plate to to do a first fix install of all of the high level services. Now when we go in, because it's all marked out, because the guys aren't standing snapping chalk lines and measuring from columns, it's all automated. They're straight in, they're hanging units, they're running duct up the centre lines. It's very, very quick. Probably like a factor of eight is normally what we've worked out. It's probably about eight times faster for our first fix. And wow. that means whenever the walls do go up, the guys who are doing the boarding have a clear run because we step back from the site and then we let them guys work away. So the old way, everyone would have been falling over each other, kicking toolboxes over, getting in each other's way. Now there's much more cohesion on site. We're in early. We get to do what we do. 
we step back, let the boarders in, do what they do. And because we're able to first fix quite a lot of the fixtures, for example, we can pull cables to positions that we know that will be coming down a wall. We can coil the cable up and then we've got into a few uh, agreements with some of the guys doing the walls that we provide them an elevation of the wall with all of the back boxes and conduit sticks fully dimensioned out. And then we leave the cable hanging in the ceiling. And when they're building the wall, they put the back box and the conduit in for us. And then when we come back to second fix, it's just a matter of feeding the cable down through the conduit and leaving it tied up for the final fix, guys. So it, it benefits everyone on site. It's not just us, really. You know, it, it benefits the main contractor. We've been able to tackle some jobs that have absolutely aggressive time scales simply because we have this new way of working. Um, it, it was hard to sort of get it over the line when we first, you know, said to some of our clients, look, we're tr we want to try this with you and see if it works because it wasn't the traditional way. A lot of them were a, a bit standoffish and saying, you know, how can you stand over that? You know, how can you guarantee us that you have a level of accuracy? So fortunately, a few of our clients just took the plunge and said, right, OK, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. And it was in an immediate fact towards the point now we're becoming a preferred supplier basically because of the systems that we have the design tools the operations guys working the way they work and, and the entire turnkey package that we're now able to, to give I mean that, that certainly sounded to me like you, you know from you know if you're saying you're eight times faster with certain processes that certainly sounds to me as if you're not only meeting but probably exceeding that target back from 2011 and, and, yeah. and beyond. Um, with the what, what about cost? Is it, is it driving down the cost as well for the client? Of course, yes, because yeah. because everything is so automated now, we're, we're really trying to remove as much of the human error as possible. So we're trying to totally steer away from dimension and drawings. You know, our guys in the, in the design team would have been, you know, creating drawings at a sheet size of A1 and then the guys on site would have been printing that on a sheet size of A3. And years ago, I would have walked on the site and caught one of the guys standing with a measuring tape, trying to measure off a paper that was already printed at the wrong scale. And he was trying to scale it with a calculator on his, on his phone. And I'm just going, guys, what, what are you doing here? Like, this is not the way it needs to be done. So the sheer fact that all of the roots of the kit are, are laid out for the guys, the positions of the hangers are all kind of set out. Um, there, there really isn't too much that can go wrong now. Now, obviously, you still get the odd thing that pops up. You know, there might be a slight change in the building or, you know, a, a drop beam or something that has popped up that we didn't know about. But it's much easier to manage these smaller items that appear rather than everyone kind of running about, getting in each other's way, and then, oh, my goodness, there's a problem over there. It really has. We've, we've really noticed the effect and, and the positive input for not only ourselves, but all of the, the guys that we're working with, all the clients and all the, the similar contractors on site. And one of the, one of the other things I, I think, so, you know, yeah. I just want to pick at something you said um, a little while ago. Um, one of the problems that I've seen occasionally has been that, you know, a job has actually been modelled beautifully and coordinated and crash detected really well. And then what is constructed on site doesn't necessarily match the model and so problems come but you, you mentioned methodologies through which you're beginning, beginning to establish beginning. that what's installed on site is matching your 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 models obviously prefabrication helps that too but it does i mean you're right i've been involved in so many projects now over the last 16 years from i started um you know there's been so many times that We've worked to a, a structural Revit model, for instance, that perhaps a structural consultant has produced in stage three. And then that has been passed to a steel contractor who doesn't work in Revit and, and doesn't produce a Revit model. He will produce, obviously, all of his construction drawings in a traditional sense in 2D drawings. But any of those changes that happens in the frame aren't picked up in the 3D model that we're working to. So many times I've walked on the site and perhaps we've made an alliance for ductwork to set down under a large beam. Um, when I go to site to survey it and I walk into the room and there's no beam because they've figured out how to lift the beam and tie the floor slabs into the web of the beam, removing that from the issue. Whereas we've sent prefabricated ductwork to the site 
to avoid this obstacle, and then it doesn't exist. So we look silly, and you know what what we're trying to do there, okay? So it costs us money because we won't believe that as it is. You know that adds extra pressure, loss to the ductwork, it stresses the fans. We will rectify that normally at our own cost, but you, so, you do find so, that so, at times, yes, it does. But we're 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 looking at technology to try and enable that as much as we can. Uh, we recently demoed the XR10 headset from Trimble. Um, we had some of our, our local reps, the Korak guys, Kevin Colwell and Enda came and they gave us a, a demo of the headset on a building that we're actually building for ourselves across the way. And we were able to go into this, this the frame uh, really, really early and bring the, the rabbit model in as a hologram and be able to look at it in situ against the building. And that was absolute space age stuff for us. So. We're currently looking at that technology now. There's a bit of investment to be had uh, to, to try and do that. Um, that's kind of on my roadmap here for the next 12 months to try and bring augmented reality to the sites. But technology is going to be the key to this, to, to, to solve these problems going forward. That also sounded to me, though, that as, as though there are still slips in the coordination by whoever's, you know, bringing those... Um, Bringing those models together, because really, of course, that sh you know the the, the uh, steelworks subcontractors' models should be still be brought in, coordinating clash detection. Yeah, and they they work. that particular project, no one was prepared to pay to, to change the model, and they just said, "Ah, sure, it'll be close enough." And sure enough, it wasn't. <laughs> but, you know, thankfully, that these instances are are getting smaller and smaller as as buildings are getting smarter and the process is getting smarter. I would be going back maybe four or five years ago that that was, certainly. Okay, so uh, so Gary, uh, I wouldn't. I, I'd love to try to. I, I think you have implied these in your answers, but I'd love to see maybe maybe be a bit more explicit in terms of the benefits that are from what you are doing, the benefits that are provided to your customer, the the owner of the actual project so what 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 are those that uh, that you found and also do you guys get to uh, essentially boast that information as metrics in terms of like we're able to provide you uh projects uh, ahead of schedule under budget so on and so yeah. forth safer yeah, well i mean probably to try and think of from a client's perspective what, what we would give them assurance would probably be one of the first thing you know the they are assured that we are taking the job seriously. We are really, really looking at this thing. We're not kind of just throwing drawings out for the sake of drawings. You know, we really are considering the design and the level of detail that we go into. Um, you know, when we're modeling our models, we're literally modeling right down to the, the screws, the bolts and the nuts. Um, for our own purpose as well, because we're able to schedule a lot of this out of the models now, we're, we're currently on our roadmap to digitizing our takeoff processes, whereas traditionally we were doing takeoffs from 2D drawings. At the moment we're working through, you know, we've got this beautiful big BIM model and it's full of data, it's full of objects. How do we quantify that and, and use that for our, our purchasing systems and our costing? So that's kind of what we're doing at the minute. But for the client side, you know, because we engage really early and you know, we keep them in the loop as well. You know, um, we use technology like the virtual reality and, and visualization tools like Enscape and all these different things that we try and engage as much as we can with the client for repeat business as much as everything as well. You know, these guys know that when they get us on board, they know the package that we're bringing to the table and the, they know the expertise. We have design engineers on board as well. We're not just a contractor, we're a design and build contractor. We have um, chartered engineers, both mechanically and electrically, working for us. Um, so when we take on a job as design and build, we don't necessarily just inherit the stage three model from the, the, the MEP consultants on board. By all means, we accept it and we look at it and we take it on board and we see what way they have designed it. And then we start fresh basically every time. We will never inherit someone else's model and just slap cane on to the front of it and go with it. You know, We will certainly consider what they've done, but what you find with consultants is that their models are used for tendering and pricing, so they'll always kind of over egg it a wee bit. They'll add extra bends and they'll add extra T's and stuff, so that you know whenever the contractor builds it, he's not coming at the end of the process with a massive VE saying, 
this is what it actually took to build this thing. We attack it from the opposite angle. We value engineer it straight off the bat. You know, we're looking to make it as lean and as sort of, how would you say, you know, as good as we can make it, as efficient as we can make it, you know, that we're not wasting time and materials and chasing our tails for nothing. You know, we will wave it blank and we'll we'll start again and we'll design it from the ground up. But we keep the client on board from day one. You know, we tell them that we're doing that. We give them access to our model. We share the model at a regular interval for clash detections. We do visualizations with the clients. You know, I'll go over and I'll put the headsets on people and we let them see what it's how it's building and we, and we value their input as well not just for our client the main contractor but the end client you know the person who's going to take the building at the end we, we ask that they have an input you know uh, and they can see what the end product is going to be so the assurance is there for them that you know we're taking it serious and, and, and we're, we're working to our very best and off the back of that you know there's efficiencies there's sustainabilities obviously the world that we live in at the moment you know we're always pushing for to, you know the zero carbon, you know, all the, the sort of buzzwords that you could insert there for, for sustainability. But we do take sustainability extremely seriously in this company. Um, we, when we're, because we are, our head office is basically situated across an ocean from the site. We try and make sure that we're not, you know, we, we minimize the amount of deliveries. We maximize the amount of technology that stops people having to get on an airplane and fly to site that we used to do. You know, we try and do as much virtual meetings, augment, you know, VR meetings, Teams meetings. We were doing that even long before the pandemic. You know, we were kind of going down that road already just to try and meet our sustainability goals. One of the key drives in the industry in recent years has been this move to get involvement from, from all those parties who actually are installing and, you know, building this stuff on site at a far earlier stage in the in the process. Now it sounds to me from what you just said is that you know you're you're actually seeing this and seeing some positive outcomes from that. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're involved in a project at the moment with Roma Dixon's um Gascoin estate. And we were lucky enough to be brought on at stage three. Um, we employed a, an external consultant to work with us, THD, great bunch of guys, uh, and they cut, sort of came on board with us. And they worked very closely with us to do the stage three design. But what we did was we got them to work in our project, in our project sphere, so that they were working to our standards. They were creating all the drawings in the model using our title blocks and all of our way of modeling so that when it transitioned to stage four, instead of what we normally do of taking a consultant's model, looking at it and thinking, yes, I agree with you there, I don't agree with you there, that was already a key model at that stage. And in fact, even while they were designing in stage three and we were getting portions of the model that we knew were pretty much finished in a sense, we were in at that stage modeling to LOD 400, putting in clips and fixtures and really finishing that out to a prefabrication stage, even at stage three, because we had such an early engagement with the structural engineer and the architect that we knew we had, we'd ironed out all of the kinks as such, you know, we knew that everything was going to fit, the kit was selected, you know, we were confident in that what we had designed could be manufactured and it was basically paused to the point where once stage four happened and then we sort of refreshed the drawings and made sure everyone was okay, we were able just to go straight to construction, hit the button and the factory out the back started producing. Well, that, that's interesting because what you're doing there is, is pulling the detailed design forward. Pretty but much, a lot yeah. of jobs yeah. at those really early stages really of design, early stage as, we design know, as we all know, um, will die. You know, they'll, for whatever reason, they will stop. Do you think there's a role for guys like yourselves to model zones within which you're guaranteeing you will fit? Uh, fit the gear at a later stage so that you're not going to that that, that expense on something that, you, that isn't yet going to happen? It is hard because, you know, I'm speaking from experience in projects that were successful. You know, it maybe doesn't apply across all projects. I've certainly seen projects change quite rapidly from one design intent to another from stage three to stage four. You know, uh, one project might have you know a, a massive gas-fired LTHW system and then 
once the client considers it and looks at the cost, he might come to the table then and say, well, no, guys, look, I have I would like to put an air source heat pump system in here instead. So, you know, that totally flips everything in its head. And, and it has happened to us even on projects where we had pretty much detailed out a full system on boilers and stuff. And then we get word from one of the meetings that, no, guys, we're now flipping the air source heat pump and half the kit has to come out and it has to go back in. So... As regards to zones for like ceiling depths and stuff, certainly yes, we would engage very, very early and say to the guys, you know, we've got X amount of pipes, X amount of trays in that ceiling void. You have to make sure that there's adequate space in there for access and maintenance. But in other senses, sometimes it can work and sometimes it can't. It, it depends on the client. There's so many moving pieces, but certainly moving in that direction to try and get as early engagement as possible, I think, certainly is beneficial to everyone um not to sort of you know be disrespectful to any mep consultants that are on board but you know the, the guys who do this every day building it on site have much better site experience and knowledge of all of these systems than someone who just you know designs it day in and day out and they're just drawing schematics and and line drawings with sort of indications when you're actually physically fitting all of these things on site and you see the intricacies and certainly when you're like us and you actually have to physically commission the systems and get them to work, there's a there's an experience and a knowledge there that would certainly be very beneficial at a much, much earlier stage in the design process, I think. So I'm going to I'm going to interject real quick because we're we are actually running out of time. So we have time for one more piece. Can you believe it? This thing went this this, this show flew by. But I wanted I, I think we would be uh, remiss if we did not uh, give Gary the opportunity to um, uh, describe a, a case study that he shared with us around the, the Claridge's Hotel in London. The story was in, in the, the, the use of the technology that you utilized and how this project came to fruition was, was so outstanding that I want to make sure our listens, listeners hear to it. So, so uh, enough of me. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that project? Yeah, certainly. Um, the Claridge's Hotel project, um, we were asked to consider it in around about 2018. And it was a completely landmark project. Um, the Claridge's Hotel itself is probably one of the most prestigious hotels in Europe, certainly. Um, it's situated in Mayfair, in the centre of London, which is a very, very uh, high-class part of, of London. And the hotel itself um, plays host to royalty and celebrities and very important people. If anyone comes to visit Her Majesty the Queen, normally they would stay in Claridge's. It's, it's almost like a preferred option. So... The hotel was bought by the Maybourne Group uh, in the early 2000s, and almost immediately they looked to upgrade the facilities of the hotel. Unfortunately, the hotel was built in sort of two wings. There was a much older part of the building, which was built in the 1800s, and then there was a new uh, Art Deco wing that was on the side, which was built in around, I believe, the 1920s. And what the, the hotel was hoping to do was to add a number of six-star suites and almost like a, a spa and pool facility to the hotel and the only way that they could go was was upwards obviously it's in a very dense part of london um, but unfortunately all of the existing m and e plant room was on the roof so they really had no other option than to consider going down and that's exactly what they did so they brought arup on board for a bit of um how would you say design consultant and they dug a few test pits underneath the hotel and realized that the hotel was sitting on London clay and that it was feasible. So they brought a company called McGee's in and they undertook the process of basically creating a six floor superstructure below the hotel whilst the hotel remained open and trading, which was an absolutely amazing feat of engineering. Um, we were brought on board when it was pretty much finished and the first day I walked on the site, I was absolutely bowled over by what those guys had, had achieved. You know, the, the amount of sheer amount of soil underneath that hotel that was dug out by hand and this massive concrete substructure underneath the hotel uh, was amazing. Uh, and it was breathtaking. And all of it was done through a hole in the existing basement slab that was only three and a half metres square. And the basement measured 100 metres long, 25 metres wide, and was about 55 metres deep at its deepest point. 
So I think I worked out something like 200,000 cubic meters of soil was removed through a hole no bigger than 15 feet square, if there's any Americans listening. Um, it was an amazing feat of engineering. So when we were brought on board, um, we sort of had to do a, a pitch to the client and we showed them you know, the technologies that we were using. But at that stage, we, can't, we were only sort of scratching the surface with technology. We were quite an established m and &E contractor and we were really good at doing BIM models, but we didn't have a lot of the technologies on board that we're now using. And it was actually the Claridge's hotel project that brought a lot of the technologies to the table. So initially when we brought on board, the, the logistics of the site were unreal. You know, there was no site storage. There was limited access around the back of the hotel because all of the clientele were walking in there to the front of the hotel. So immediately we realized, you know, the logistics of this job is going to have to make us look at this in a totally different light. We, we cannot attack this job like a traditional job, you know, Normally we would have a site storage and offices and all that kind of stuff and this that just wasn't going to happen on this project. So when we looked at it, we realized, you know, prefabrication was going to be the key for this job. And that really put us in a pole position with the client because we were quite an established prefabrication contractor at that stage. So the first thing that we did was we brought on um, a local crowd to do a point cloud scan of the, the substructure. So we sent a guy in and he did a point cloud scan for us which allowed us to consider the site off-site. It let us look at a digital twin of the, the project and we weren't, didn't have to have feet on the ground at that stage. So we went away and we also employed another company to produce a really highly accurate structural model from the point cloud data. And that allowed us to work to a model that we knew the tolerances were within one or two millimetres so that we could really look at how much of this that we could prefabricate. And the very bottom level was B5, that was the lowest, and that was the, the, the plant room. It was where all the boilers and the chillers and all of the heavy plant were situated. The fourth floor was the air handling plant room, where there was 27 air handling units and massive amount of ductwork. Some of the ductwork was up to two metres in width. Uh, the third floor, I believe, was like a, a, an office space for a lot of the staff. The second floor was a spa, and the first floor was a swim pool. So it was phenomenal that all of this was contained below the hotel, and people, you know, sitting in the in the fine dining restaurant, eating away, not knowing that there was an army of guys below their feet building. So when we really get into it, I'm, I'm assuming that. I'm assuming they, they filled in the three and a half by three and a half meter hole before they put the pool in. Uh, <laughs> funny, it, with that pool, would you believe? Um, I could show you a few, um, if we ever, uh, you know, there's, I have some of the shots of the point cloud that was amazing. When we got down underneath the original basement slab and you look up, you can see a negative imprint of all of the tool marks of the guys who laid that foundation slab a hundred years ago that would never have seen the light of day. And when you're standing looking up, you can see all the individual shovel marks and rake marks, you know, of, of the tools that they used 100 years ago. It was phenomenal. So when we started getting really into it, we, we think, right, how are we going to get everything down this hole? You know, some of the pipes that we had in B5 were 12 inch diameter. Uh, it was really, really heavy duty pipework. So we, we realized quite quickly we were going to have to go down the modular route. You know, we weren't going to be able to stand and grind and weld on site. We were going to have to try and prefabricate as much as we could. So we decided that we would try and double decker quite a lot of the pipework and encase it in a steel framework. But that steel frame had to be dimensioned so that it could fit down that hole. Everything had to go down the hole. So we really spent a lot of time engineering the modules and making everything modular all along the bottom. And it, it worked out really well. You know, the, 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 between our BIM model and our point cloud capture, we were able to simulate bringing all of these things down through the hole. And even it, it wasn't a perfectly square shaft. The shaft actually stepped on X and Y axis the whole way down, just with building tolerance, obviously. You know, it, it wasn't a perfectly smooth uh, tunnel. We almost had to draw a square inside the point cloud to figure out the absolute size of something because we couldn't really have anything sort of knocking the whole way down, quite a lot of the stuff was, was quite sensitive. And even all of the kit that we had to bring down had to fit down through the holes. And the kit itself, we couldn't change the dimensions of the kit. You know, the kit 
was the kit. So we had to engage really early with a lot of the manufacturers and suppliers of the kit to make sure that anything that we proposed first and foremost could fit down the hole. So some of the chillers that we brought, I think there was one chiller was six tons and we had to lower that down 50 meters of shaft uh, and we ended up having to rotate it on its nose and dropped it 50 meters all the way down the shaft to the bottom. So our prefab guys actually came up with a really ingenious solution of almost like a sliding door at every level. So we had like a trap door that would close at every level and this thing could get winched down level by level and supported and almost had to be rejigged at certain levels because of the length of the, the chains and we were able to bring in A-frames and, and change the positions and drop it on down. So it was an amazing project to be involved in um, and it all kind of went really smoothly. Um, another technology that we kind of brought in for that then was our precision setting out. Um, you know, we put all this effort into producing all of this prefabricated stuff, but we really couldn't rely on guys measuring with tapes and snapping chalk lines in the basement for a human error aspect, first and foremost, but also for time constraints. You know, we had to schedule, because there was no storage on site, we really had to manufacture and schedule each piece, almost building from the furthest point of the floor back towards the, the lowering point which was in one far corner so we reached out to um, a couple of friends that I have who work for Lega Geosystems and they proposed um, the icon system of precision setting out which is normally used for civils and structures it's not really ever used for MEP but they said look you know this machine will allow you to pinpoint a point with extreme accuracy could you possibly use that for for your you're setting out and we were like yeah we'll, we'll have a go so we were a bit dubious about it at first we were kind of unsure we've never used this before so what we did was um, we were due to core holes for soil pipes so we placed a point on the top of the slab for where it was the core would go and we marked the direct underside of the same point and then we dropped the core and when we inspected the core it was within one millimeter accuracy so we knew straight away this is going to work. So we looked at our modules and we looked at all the positions where the modules were going to uh, hang from the slab and we placed the coordinate points at all of the module fixings. And what that did was that allowed our guys to go on to site and set these positions out long in advance of any of the modules coming. Then those points were able to be pre-drilled. The anchor fixings were placed with resin anchors. So they were allowed to set and then we brought another company in to do a, a load test on them because these frames were very, very heavy. Some of them were almost a ton in weight. So we did a pull test on the fixings as a, almost a, a guarantee that nothing was going to fail because it was quite a, a, a sensitive area. So once the module started arriving, we did it on three modules just to start, just to see, was this going to work? And the first three modules came and the three modules were hung in two hours. And we could not believe it. We were like, that is out of this world. And that was the nod then. Yes, this this will work. So we, we so used that then. Not. We Then we turned the focus to all of the rigs that sat on the floor. So all of our pump sets and there were a lot of big plate heat exchangers and very large bits of kit, as I said. So we started placing coordinate points at the very corners of all these so that when the rigs came to site, we could set them exactly where they needed to go. So if you imagine that there's a pump rig on the floor and there's a module above your head, that also allowed us to prefabricate the connecting pieces of pipework between both mating flanges without having to have guys site measuring and, and you know normally you would you would you would measure that on site and the guys would cut and weld that on site, just that small piece of pipe. But we actually trialed it and said, no, let's see what happens if we prefabricate that as well. You know, will that come together as intended? And it literally was millimeter perfect. So literally, I would say 98% of that floor was prefabricated and came in in pieces. And instead of having a squad of 50 guys cutting, welding, grinding, there was maybe only 10, 15 guys who were basically just bolting wow. stuff together. That's all they were really doing. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's that story is just, just, awesome. just awesome. Uh, and thank you so much for 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 expounding mm -hmm. on that one. I I would not have done it justice in terms of uh, the, describing all of the the fine points, and I'm sure there's there's a lot more. Uh, final question. Uh, so this is the final final question. I think I 
said it before that it was, but now I lied. So now here we are. So this is a, a question that we ask all of our guests. It's around, uh, you know, what is a motto, a, a motto uh, that you live by or that you find interesting? For example, uh, to, to keep with the, the, the European flair, uh, my favorite football club, Liverpool Football Club, has You'll Never Walk Alone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got, I got, I got Ben yep. shaking his head at me. And uh, Gary, are you a supporter of Liverpool? No, or no? Uh, my two brothers are. They're both diehard Liverpool supporters, but me and my father, we're both Man United supporters, Manchester United. Uh, that's, that's uh, sorry, worse, yeah. Yeah. it is at the moment we had a good few years there but um, unfortunately it's not went too well since Sir Alex has left us so well, I'm an Arsenal fan so uh, so with uh, that things haven't been going too well for us either oh. <laughs> my best mate's an Arsenal fan as well so I know what it's like <laughs> so with that um, do you have a motto that you find interesting or a motto that you actually live well, by from a very young age when I started in this game, I worked under a, a, a fantastic engineer, Brian Diamond is his name, and he used to always say to us uh, when we were young guys, if you do not have the time to do it right the first time, when will you have time to fix it? So that's like how that. we approach like everything here. Anyone who works for me gets told that, you know, get it right the first time. It might take you slightly longer, but that slight bit of time is more valuable than trying to do it later on when you're under pressure on another project and you're you're somewhere else and it's i think it's a good model to live by uh, that's brilliant well thank you uh thank you so much gary uh ben thanks for Pleasure. joining us as well uh for everybody here at the connected construction show thanks for tuning in uh and we'll look forward to seeing you all next time stay Goodbye. connected thank you Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Construction Show. For more information, visit us at connectedconstructionshow.com.